We're looking at the problem of delirium and we're going to focus on the management of delirium a little bit later on, but I think, I don't know, I think it's really important to try and have a think about what we're going to talk about and try and define what delirium is. And I don't know what you think, but I quite like the nice definition, which is that delirium, which is sometimes called an acute confusional state is a common clinical syndrome characterized by disturbed consciousness, disturbed cognitive function or perception which has got an acute onset. Start suddenly and a fluctuating course, it comes and goes usually develops over a couple of days and it's really not good and it's associated with poorer outcomes, but it can be prevented and treated if dealt with urgently. I think. That's a really good definition, it's quite clinical, I think practically you're looking at any time someone changes from their normal state, having a really clear idea of what someone is usually like what's normal for them and noticing that actually something has acutely changed. So as you say it, normally comes on over a day or so, and that change can be into a hyperactive state or until hypoactive state. Those are the two main types of delirium that we see. Sometimes you can have a mixed picture where people experience both, but those are the things that you're looking for. It's in the hyperactive delirious patients. They're very agitated. They usually quite highly responsive to any stimulus around them and require quite a lot of skill to manage and keep calm and keep safe. And those people tend to be picked up quite quickly because they're declaring themselves around the warden and themselves known, but the hypoactive delirious group can be much to spot and is quite often missed and it's very underdiagnosed and underrecognized. And those patients can just simply be quite withdrawn, quite quiet, not engaging, with therapies, sleeping, a lot. During the day, these are people to pick out as maybe having hypoactive delirium, and the root causes of the same and the consequences of the delirium is the same regardless of the type that they're experiencing. So one of the things that we wanted to do is to really look at the different perspectives and bring together either the different perspectives of each topic that we talked about. So we have spoken to some of them in our hospital about what to do in means to them. I'm a not bidding doctor to me. Delirium means may be instances when the patient is showing signs of forgetfulness confusion. Basically, from the clinical point of view, it needs further investigation with it because there can be several reasons which might have given rise to delirium, so it can be an important in our setting for us as a physiotherapist delirium. Impacts on my role as a physio by delaying a patient's rehab on the wards. And if it's not detected early enough, this is is quite frustrating for me as a physio because I think it can be avoided at times. Well, I'm an occupational therapist and in terms of our sessions are functional sessions, sometimes there can be a real limitation in attention with this with the sessions. So so trying to hold someone's concentration for a period of time enough to make something happen and then also from session to session getting someone to carry over that information from one to another and really be able to recall it. Next time you see them I'm in charge nurse delirium, to me means the huge and dug patient presence with especially after their operation and some of them. Presence as agitated and difficult to manage and some of them are present being very quiet and is this those that represent, very quiet that are very difficult to diagnose and to manage. Yeah, so I think that's really good. You can hear from them that it means a little bit different to each person, depending on quite what their role is and what they gets really. Comment. It can be almost up to 50% of my patients become delirious at some point after their surgery and there was a really nice article published in JAGS last year and that the reference will be in the show notes about the different subtypes of delirium and you can they graphically look at patients who had delirium and they looked at whether or not they were hypoactive hyperactive or, or a mixed type of delirium on each individual day and it's really good graphical representation that some patients may actually be hypoactive one day and hyperactive the next and you know they can and will make split between us between. Yeah, and I think delirium was really going back through the literature. It has really shown a new, he wasn't it back in, then it late 1990s, who kicked off the research that, we've got now into the management of delirium and what we do to look after patients? Delirium did she develop the CAM? Yes, I think that's what she's accomplished. Yeah, and that's it. You are used to? Yeah, that's the confusion assessment method, isn't it? Yeah? And yeah I used to really like it but I don't know these days. I find it quite hard to do because you have to go through. Sort of, you, have to ask yourself, 
is this an acute onset and does it fluctuate? So there's kind of two questions in camp to do. That, is there evidence of acute change in patient's mental status? And then did this behavior fluctuate during the day? I think you've got to spend quite a lot of time with somebody to work that out. And then you need some evidence of attention. You've got to find out a test that, you're going to do two tests attention and in the cam it doesn't tell you what that is. And then you've got to find some evidence of disorganized thinking or altered conscious state. I don't know, I used to really like the camber. I'm going off it a bit these days. My opinions cam is that is good. I mean it's a good evidence base behind you, expect people up, but they're practically, it's quite, difficult to do, it's a really nice definition of all the things you've just said, there are the things that you use to define delirium. In the episode, you know, it's all the but just practically it is quite difficult to use and people always kind of gloss over a little bit because it's you need one or two. Is it one or two of the first two and then one or two of the last two? So it's just, it's, more difficult to score. Yeah? And I think that that puts people off using it which means that in actually we were picking up less delirium. Cause it's simple. It's a question of is the patient alert and really you've got the normally alert. They're mildly sleepy for- Yes, I think coming back to what we were saying about predisposing. A precipitating medications, have a huge role to me. And you often find patients become delirious as a direct result of one of the medications that the doctor has started. Now, there are some medications that are obvious and we know cause delirium. For example, morphine we know causes delirium. Excycontin definitely does, oxybutyne in the most horrendous drug in the world. In my opinion, you'll hear this many times definitely does. And why does it? because they affect the acetylcholine levels. And there are lots of biochemical theories about it around. Maybe another time, we'll talk about them when we understand them, but one of them is that the acetylcholine levels are really important in the functioning of their brain. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in the brain. Yes. There, when one nerve cell comes along at the end of that nerve cell, there's a bunch of little acetylcholine and the electrical signal comes along it pings, a stock hole in which breaks out of this nerve cell travels across. Little tiny gap and hits the next nerve cell and sends an electrical signal, damage that nerve cell. And, that's how things normally work. That's how things normally work. If one of these drugs are anticholinergics, they break that break, that pod will make it much more difficult for the normal processes. Yes. They stop the signals getting from point A, to point B, and which means the brain doesn't work so well and there's a thing called the acetylcholine burden until you can look at the patient's drugs and you can work out how much acetylcholine effect that they have. So now there are some drugs that are designed to affect the acetylcholine receptors. So for example, oxybutynin, which is a drug that we give for bladder problems is designed to work on the bladder, by hitting acetylcholine or reducing it. It also reduces it in the brain and patients get confused. You know, a lot of their drugs that we give don't just do the thing that we want them to do so stuff like furosemide, stuff like warfarin, stuff like phenetone, which is an anti-epilepsy drug. All have little bits of effect on acetyl. Choline. Digoxin, isoprolol propranolol. There's loads of using all the time. Yeah, every day, you'll see all of your patients on. Yes. And a point comes, when somebody's on one of, them, it's not a problem, is it? No, but it's when that are on three or four of them that adds up to quite a lot, it all builds up, and I think that's the thing is that sort of small little things that build up to make a big effect. Absolutely. And that's whether the pharmacist on the wards and the doctors themselves. He's looking through the drug chart and doing a drugs review. It's a really really important part of managing delirium that I think is sometimes not done quite as well as it could be and this is the same for delirium and dementia. So any cognitive impairment this process will be interrupted by those drugs. So it doesn't have to just be delirium but it's an area where actually we can make a big impact really for relatively you know simple interventions yes. Just thinking. About each drug and gang. 
Does this need to be there but despite that there are still some patients? It is difficult to manage sometimes. Yeah, and delirium can be chronic. Yeah, so it can lie, you know, typically resolves when the underlying cause is treated. But for some people it does it does go on for much longer in it, can you can get a chronic form of learning that they can last several, months. But it's quite interesting. There's a, there's another paper that actually looks at frailty and frailty is something that again, we will do an episode on fertility, because it's huge and it's a big tropic at the moment. So there's another argument that there's an aspect of frailty that puts people at risk for delirium. Yeah. And that, that all fitting together that whole process. Yeah. So, that vulnerability to, dresses that you were talking about and that manifesting is their brain decompensation, which is essentially what delirium is the same as it presents a physical decompensation. And that we see so falls or reduced mobility, which is ability to look after themselves at home. There's also this question from from actually some of the same people that wrote the NICE guidance, saying that actually perhaps their relative benefit of those delirium prevention measures, particular in terms of the adverse outcomes down the line so mortality, where they're discharged to may be dependent on their frailty state and that's not something that's really been looked at properly before. So I think Anu is the only person who hinted at it by looking at people who have multiple risk, factors for delirium being less likely to recover from it. Yeah, and that may in turn therefore suggest that those patients are frailer, actually no one's done that. And there are although frailties difficult to find clinically in research terms there. There are, there are frailty scores that are used quite commonly in research, so that capabilities are so that's that's an area of untapped research. I think the moment that we should be really important and the counter-argument that these authors of this paper suggests is that actually, perhaps those people at the highest risk of delirium. So the frailest, the people with the multiple risk factors for delirium are the ones that are least likely to actually benefit from a multi-component intervention, in terms of long-term outcomes, thinking that predisposing factors and their precipitating factors. They're basically saying that their predisposing factors are so huge, it's almost inevitable that they'll become delirious and therefore, even with those small interventions that we're doing, we're not going to prevent it. Yeah, that's why I took from it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I think the thing to put here and I think the thing for almost of geriatrics is actually is mortality a good entry point for us to be measuring and I think that it would be very difficult to think that these interventions aren't just kind and nice. Anyway and there's a significant number of people